influence of one drug. Television, the drug of a nation, breeding ignorance and feeding radiation on television. The drug of a nation, breeding ignorance and feeding radiation TV. Yeah. I wanted to start with undoubtedly one of the best opinions and one of the best hot takes on television of all time by the disposable heroes of hypocrisy, television the drug of the nation. This is uh, my final lecture on MS120. Uh, I'm going to look probably at the key 20th century medium, the invention of creation of and social and cultural effects of the television. So there'll be one more lecture to come after this, but uh, Rhys Jones is going to do that one on um, the uh, development of the personal computer and the origins of the internet. Kind of brings us right up to date in terms of media history. Um, you will see on Canvas that there is a lecture proposed on broadcasting in Wales. Now that's usually delivered by my colleague Dr Elaine Price. Um, Elaine is um, away on maternity leave at the moment. Um, I was going to try and do that lecture myself, but instead what I've decided to do is, as soon as I can't do it as well as Elaine would be able to do it anyway, because it's her area of expertise, um, I've decided to remove it from the assessment full stop. So there won't be a question asked of you in assessment two on this. With regards to assessment two, I am working at the moment to get a resolution uh, with regards to the exam. And as soon as I have a positive answer on that, I will let you know what the state of play is with regards to assessment two. So without further ado, let's get into television. <clears throat> really what I want to concentrate on is two elements. The invention of television, so the technological factors that went into the development of the medium and the history of UK television through the entirety of the 20th century. And really, I kind of end up in the 21st century. So media history's come all the way from when we were talking about Johannes Gutenberg right up to today with this lecture. So in terms of television, if we think back to the radio lecture that I did a few weeks ago, at the beginning of that, I went through the kind of um, the physics and the science underpinning the radio. And I mean, to, to an extent, this is true with the telegraph as well. You have um, a, a number of pioneers that were involved in the invention of the radio, in the invention of the telegraph. The television is no different to that. And the whole impetus to getting sort of moving images, moving pictures on the screen was going back to the 1950s and of course we've already discussed the uh, invention of the cinema which is television's closest um, relative in terms of media um, but what was required in order for television to happen there were four distinct inventions that needed to be made before television could become viable so firstly a device to change light into an electric current that was needed first of all secondly a device to change the electric current back into light so those two things come together, right? What you have is obviously you're capturing an image using light waves. You need a device to transform that signal into an electrical signal. Then you need to transmit it just like we saw with the radio. And then you need something to decode that transmission and turn it back into light on the other side. So you need a two-sided system to work in order for television to happen. Basically, you need a scanning device to break the image up into small elements because a whole image can't be transmitted like that. When Reese talks about some of the innovations of the internet, that will also become apparent how this technology influences digital technology. And you need an electronic amplifier to increase weak signals to a usable level. So you have to assume that the signal that you're going to have is weak and you need to be able to correct that weakness in some way. Those four elements were absolutely critical to the television and they had to be invented before the television could take form. So the first of these happened in 1873 when a telegraph operator discovered that light affected the electrical resistance of an element called uh, selenium. Soon realized it was possible to change light into electricity using a selenium photocell. After that, Paul Nipko's work in Germany, he invented a disc with single spiral holes in it, what we call a Nipko disc, um, as a method of mechanical scanning for television. So we've got the 
light system sorted we've got the scanning system sorted although nipco was ever able to actually build a working system he did prove scientifically and through demonstration that it was possible to be done what was needed now is the device to turn an electric signal back into light conventional light bulb is useless because it can't vary its brightness when you think about television obviously you have lots of different colors you have lots of different shades you have lots of different uh, hues of light um, so a conventional light bulb, no good in a television system. The neon lamp developed by Georges Claude in France was used by many early television pioneers. So this is a light lamp using the element neon, which could change color based on the properties of the gas in it, the neon gas. But that most important breakthrough happened actually earlier than that when Karl Braun in Germany invented the cathode ray tube. The Braun tube, although couldn't be used for televisions at the time of invention, the principles underpinning the cathode ray tube would become absolutely essential. And really up until the, probably the mid 2000s, cathode ray televisions were still the standard build for televisions for the home. So only in probably the last 15 years that we've switched to LEDs and plasma and so on. So the last invention in this chain comes in 1906 when an American Lee De Forest invented the Amplion, an amplifying triode valve. Excuse me a second. Thank you. Making it possible to amplify the weak uh, video signals created by selenium photocells. Basically, a, much like we saw actually with the radio and the idea of using electromagnetic waves um, generated by a transmitter, the um, Amplion works to pick up the signal of the um, the weak video signal and boost that signal on the site of the television. A working amplifier took him another six years, so we're talking 1912 when this was possible, and 10 years would pass before actually the system was good enough to use for television in a broadcast medium sense, so we're talking 1922. So the actual period of development, if you think going back to 1873 for the first sort of of the four elements to fall into place, but things wouldn't actually fall perfectly into place until 1922. It's talking the best part of what? 50 years in order for this to work. Now, this is a much slower um, development than the telegraph, than the radio. Um, really, in many ways, much slower than cinema as well. And it's slow because of the complexity of the transmission of so much information via uh, electrical wave. You know, um, this radio transmits sound. Sound has certain properties, but sound is relatively easy to transmit. Transmitting visual images, much more complex, requires a far more complex set of machinery to achieve this effect. And then we turn to the man who is usually said as being the um, inventor of TV, John Logie Baird, a Scotsman. So. Um, Probably the first Scotsman we've encountered, with the exception of uh, Baker and his um, panorama that we've encountered in this module. So John Logie Baird, very, very important figure in the history of television. Now, if you look at that image just above his nameplate there, that is basically what Baird built as one of the first mechanical televisions. I'm sure you've all owned a TV. Um, if you don't own a TV, you've seen one. Um, that don't look much like a TV to you or I, but that really was Baird's and first system of television. So, began to experiment with television as a medium in 1922. So obviously 1922, very important date. Using a NIPCO disc. So a mechanical system scanning images in to transmit those images and achieved his first um, transmission in 1923. Then he moved to London, um, down from Scotland to London, gave a public demonstration for Gordon Selfridge in the, in the famous uh, Selfridge's um, department store in London. Uh, this was in 1925, using a dummy called Stucky Bill. Now I have an image on the next slide of Stucky Bill there. This is what Baird's original invention was, the mechanical televisor. This, I mean, first of all, cast your eyes on Stucky Bill. That is a freaky looking doll. I don't want to see that doll. I don't want to see an image of that doll. I don't want that doll in my face. That is weird. Okay. Now, bed system here, you can see the Nipco disc at the end, right, with these uh, sort of perforations in it. Um, Baird's mechanical system, and it, it does look like a beast, right, worked to capture 
a moving image or create the effect of a moving image through those holes on the NIPCO disk. So the NIPCO disk was spun. You had then other apparatus that were there to capture images. and then, But it, the image capture wasn't as important as the transmission of the image. What was critically important was that through the NIPCO disk, which created the, Im the illusion of a continuous moving image, you have then a transmission of that image. Baird wasn't so much interested in permanent capture as he was in being able to send images over distances. So his first dem demonstrations of this technology were basically only silhouettes of things, uh, but very quickly sort of started to develop this technology, a very prolific set of innovations by John Logie Baird that actually pushed forward the television in a very rapid way. So by October 1925, he was able to scan and transmit real grayscale TV pictures. Uh, first of um, a guy called Bill, who was his assistant. And then looking for publicity, Baird visited the Daily Express to promote his invention. The news editor was absolutely terrified. And this is the quote, um, for God's sake, go down to the reception and get rid of the lunatic who's um, down there. He says he's got a machine for seeing by wireless. Watch him, he must have got a razor on him. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Daily Express obviously weren't so keen on television, and they weren't very keen on John Logie Baird as well. They, they thought he was nuts. But um, very, very quickly starts to make significant ground in the sophistication of how television works. Uh, this is a Baird televisor. Um, now, it's a chunky piece of kit, of kit, this. Now, you probably can't appreciate the scale from the image, but it's a very, very big piece of equipment here with basically all that stuff that we've just seen in the previous images in that casing. If you look to the right of the image, you can see the televisor screen. It's absolutely tiny compared to the actual equipment itself. But this is, in effect, a working television. The first working television. The principles of television are all here. Obviously, things will be going... Um, Things will get more sophisticated as time goes on and we'll get more efficient and we'll get smaller. We obviously know that. But this is how it works. This was, you know, all the principles are basically there. So Baird's other achievements at this time, 1927, as early as 1927, he demonstrated that colour TV was possible. Again, in 1927, he demonstrated a video recording service onto discs called Phonovision. So... You can see the importance of Baird already. I mean, he, he's basically encoding the entirety of a television and televisual entertainment in his early sort of work. 1928 made a successful transatlantic transmission from New York, to, uh, from sorry, from London to New York, and even in 1928 demonstrated 3D stereoscopic TV and infrared images. So pretty incredible stuff, but it all has to be taken into account. This is all very, very limited at this point in time. Baird's system was a mechanical system. Very, very important to appreciate. Now, it is electronic media, but it's a mechanical system, working parts, gears, etc. Um, the invention of electrical television is actually more significant than Baird's work. And, and for this, we have to go to the United States. And Philo T. Farnsworth, if anyone's a fan of Futurama, you'll know that the professor in Futurama is called um, Professor Farnsworth. This is why he's named after Philo T. Farnsworth. He had an idea for electronic 20 television in 1921 and got the first working system together uh, all by uh, 1927, transmitting his first image uh, on the September the 2nd. Got embroiled in all sorts of uh, problems with RCA at that time as well. But um, it, the principles of electronic te television were available at this time. Um, so in the US, um, Vladimir Zvorkin, working for RCA, produced the first electronic receiver tube and the TV camera. TV camera being an incredibly important invention, of course, the ability to capture televisual image and encode those images in a form that could be transmitted. In 1923, patent use, his patent was used versus Farnsworth, even though no actual device producing it worked in um, uh, 1931. So in the UK, we were coming up with the same things, but the US started to lead at this point. Um, as always, given that now on both sides of the Atlantic you have the principles in place for working television, 
Then, of course, as we've seen over the last few uh, lectures in the module, uh, of course, the government's going to get involved. Government's going to look at new mediums as they come up and look at it from two ways. One, does it have this kind of moral concern for citizenry in the country? And two, how can we use it for propaganda? So um, government commissions in 1934, before television is really available to the public, um, the Selsden Committee was uh, formed in the UK to investigate TV broadcasting. And in 1935, a report was recommended that the BBC started test broadcast with a view to setting up a 240-line service for broadcast television. Lines in this context refers to lines across the screen, the number of lines on a screen to make an image possible. Recognise two different competing systems, the mechanical system of John Logie Baird and the electronic system, which had developed from Field Farnsworth's time and is now largely controlled by Marconi EMI in a, a sort of combined um, business enterprise recommended a six-month trial using the two systems, each broadcasting on different weeks from one another to see which one worked best. So EMI links with uh, Marconi to make transmitters, forming the company Marconi EMI. And the BBC developed Alexander Palace as their first television studios. Alexander Palace is in the north of London, and if you're a keen sports fan, you'll already know about Alexander Palace because it's where the World Darts Championship is held every winter um, in a sort of bacchanalian orgy of drinking and singing and not really watching the darts. Here's Ali Pali, um, and there's the first television transmitter next to it. Kind of really grand setting for the medium. Really. So 2nd of November 1936, official opening ceremony um, of BBC television by John Logie Baird and re-broadcast afterwards by EMI. Broadcast two hours a day, three till 4 p.m. and nine till 10. <laughs> so it's pretty um, limited at its first point. Um, outside broadcast of the coronation of George VI was broadcast uh, from the 12th of May 1937. Um, it's won the first service because the first actual regular television service um, was in Germany, but it was the first regular high definition, i.e. 240 plus line service. So Germany had begun broadcasting television in 1935, but it was of a very low quality. What was on TV at this time? Mostly live variety acts, some pre-recorded films shown via monitor. So basically, they had a film, you know, obviously we know cinema existed at this point in time. They would, brought, they would project a film, then record that on a monitor and later, <laughs> later broadcast. It was kind of second-hand broadcast. Um, Baird, at this point, checks out. Basically, his system is far too complex. It's far too uncomfortable for performers. What we mean by that is actually to even show up on the televisor, you needed to have extreme amounts of makeup on in order to actually be picked up by the cameras. Very prone to bake down, very, very poor quality. And so therefore the Baird system was very much dropped early on. Doesn't discount that John, John Logie Baird was extremely important in the history of television, but the electronic TV definitely won. But at the early, this early stage of BBC television, I mean, we are talking extreme limited reach. You're talking about 20,000 people in London that could pick up the service. You had to be living kind of close to Alexander Palace to get a good service. And of course, you needed money as well. Televisions weren't cheap in the 1930s. So it was a very limited group of people who could actually access the television. And then World War II comes along. Um, so on the 1st of September 1939, the television service was stopped. Uh, television, the, the war was announced on television as it was on radio at the same time as well. Um, interesting, it was a Mickey Mouse cartoon and then the war was uh, declared. And basically television just stopped during this time. Indeed, we get a focus, as I've already said in the radio lecture, uh, or alluded to in the radio lecture, and talked a little bit in the newspaper lecture uh, that I recorded for you yesterday. There was a focus on radio during this time and radio became the dominant medium. Uh, indeed, the Alexandra Palace transmitter was um, actually dismantled because it was uh, used by um, Nazi bombers uh, in order to uh, sort of pinpoint areas in London because it was so prominent. <coughs> the expertise in cathode ray tube technology did actually become very important for the war effort because it aided in the development of radar and development of computing as well, which became two incredibly important aspects of the war on fascism from the UK side. Radar in order to pick up um, incoming flights and incoming um, 
and especially during the Battle of Britain, to be able to pinpoint the location of um, Nazi uh, fighter planes. Um, and in computing, obviously, I, I think most of you be aware of sort of the developments of computing in the 1940s, but obviously Reese will talk more about this. The cathode ray tubes became very important in the development of the first digital computers, which were used in code breaking exercises by the Allies. So TV closed down until 1946 at this point in time. No television during World 